Hi, me again. Um, <laughs> yeah, my name is Ryan. You've probably seen me many times hosting up here, but now you're going to see me here for longer than two minutes, so we'll see what happens. Um, as Stephen said, um, I'm one of the college pastors. I do Chi Alpha in Valley City State University, and we have an amazing time over there. Um, married, my wife is Britta. She serves in the coffee shop. Um, if you want to know which one she is, she's the one who looks like she's going to have a baby in a month and a half. That's right. We're getting baby number one, little boy. Yeah. Little boy in here. So we, they have like 3D ultrasounds now. Ah, I should have brought it up. That would have been fun. The ultrasounds are so crazy now, y'all. We could see his lips in like the photo. He looked like a baby. But I also learned is that he's inherited like my gender and nothing else. He looks exactly like his mom. Lucky for him. We're in a sermon series right now called Discover the Spirit, talking about the active work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. As Christians, we believe that God exists as a trinity, one being but three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is a divine mystery that we could spend a whole other sermon series talking about, and maybe one day we will. But now we're talking about how the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. That when Jesus, the Son, God become man, came, lived a perfect life, died, was crucified on our behalf, and was three days later resurrected, that when he ascended to be with his Father again, he said that it was our benefit that he would leave because he would send the Holy Spirit. And last week, Pastor Dave talked about how when Jesus was talking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit, he said the Holy Spirit would be the one who convicts us of sin, bringing us into belief, that he would convict us of righteousness, leading us to be more like him, and that he would remind us and he would uh, convict us of judgment, reminding us that we are not the ones who are judged, but sin and the devil are the ones who have been judged. Today, I'm going to be talking about something called the fruits of the Spirit, and if you've been around church for any period of time, you probably have heard about the fruits of the Spirit before. And so if you have, please bear with me. Maybe we'll go in a different direction today than we've gone before. And if not, if the fruits of something is like a weird, it's a phrase that you've only heard in church and you've never heard anywhere else. The fruits of, what something, of, the fruits of something is something that something produces. Did you catch that? How many somethings were in there? The fruit of something is something that something produces. For example, my wife and I are producing a human because we are humans and the fruit of humans is humans. Dogs produce puppies, cats produce kittens, goats produce kids, but different kinds. And so you can tell what something is by the fruits that it produces. Let's take it a little further. Has anyone here ever been to Orchard Glen in Fargo? If you haven't, there's even fewer people than the last time. Guys, go to Orchard Glen. It's going to be so crowded like later today. <laughs> it's going to be so many people there. It's like, what, what kind of trees are at Orchard Glen? Apple trees. We have apple trees. It's an apple orchard. And it is wonderful. It is beautiful. It smells so nice. I've never experienced like stop and smell the flowers until I went to Orchard Glen. And I was like, wow, this place is delightful. <laughs> Let's just stand here. You walk around, you pick apples. It's great. But I want you to go somewhere in your mind with me. Go somewhere in your mind. Follow along. If you haven't even been to Orchard Glen, maybe you've seen a tree before. Now just imagine there's apples growing on it. It's an apple tree. You're walking around in apple trees. You're picking apples, having a great time. You're just eating some of them. It's awesome. And you reach up to pick up another apple and your hand recoils. Do my senses deceive me? You reach out again and you pick the fruit. It's not red at all. In fact, it is orange. It's not a weird oblong apple shape. I don't know what apples are shaped like. It's a weird oblong shape. It's perfectly round. You squeeze it and orange juice comes out. It is in fact an orange. You look up, all the other fruits on the tree are the exact same. What are your deductions? This isn't an apple tree at all. This is an orange tree. What's this doing here? It should be an orange. Orange Glen, whatever that might be. Let's make an Orange Glen. We'll make it in Fargo. Then I'm not the kind of guy that can look at a tree and tell you what kind of tree it is, unless it's an evergreen. That's pretty easy. It's the one that's always green. But if I looked at a fruit tree, I couldn't tell you what kind of fruit, uh, what kind of a tree it was until I saw the fruit that it was bearing. I'm like, okay, this has got apples on it. It's an apple tree. This one's got oranges on it. It's an orange tree. You can tell what something is by the fruit that it produces. Even though that 
orange tree is in an apple orchard, and I thought that it was an apple tree this entire time until it grew fruit. I realized its fruit tells me that it's not an apple tree. Even though it's got leaves and everything like an apple tree, it's an orange tree, even though it's in the same place that everyone is. And we're kind of like that too. That we can say we are one thing, but our fruit shows us what we really are. We can say things all day, but the fruit of our lives, I can tell somebody that I love them, but the actual fruit of my life, the things that I produce, will show what that actually means. And the fruits of the Spirit is a phrase that's found in the Bible, in the book of Galatians. And the book of Galatians is actually a letter. There was a guy named Paul who was completely opposed to Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus' followers because he thought Jesus was a false god. He was having his followers arrested, having them killed, and he was on the road to a new city to have them be arrested and killed when Jesus appeared to him in the middle of the road. This was after Jesus had ascended. And he had, Paul had an encounter with Jesus that transformed him and he became a missionary. And he went and planted churches all around the Mediterranean Sea which was a lot harder to go around back then because you had to go by boat and it wasn't just a plane ride, it was a longer time. And when he would leave those places, he would write letters back to his, the churches that he had planted, giving them encouragement, giving them instruction, and giving them correction. And a lot of those letters are found in the Bible. It's Romans, First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Thessalonians. And one of them is written to a people in a town called Galatia. And that is the letter of Galatians. And we're going to start in Galatians 5, 19 through 25. And Paul is placing aside two different types of fruits of two different types of lives. And for you note takers out there, my message today is called Check Your Root. And it will make sense very shortly. The message today is Check Your Root. Galatians 5, 19, the acts of the flesh, which means our selfish desires. Whenever Paul th- sees flesh, think my selfish desires. They're obvious sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to take a pause right here. How are we doing? (laughs) You didn't think we could say those kinds of words in church. I was, I was preparing for this. I went back and forth like, can I say that? Well, it's in the Bible, so we can say it. <laughs> we, we can talk about it. We're here. Go ask your parents. Um, basically, what we're seeing here is Paul is dichotomizing and saying, if we're just left to our own devices, if you just set me and put me over here and just left me alone, these are the kinds of things that get produced in our world. And do, I need, like, do I need to really convince anybody of that? That when human beings are kind of left to ourselves, we don't tend towards good, we tend towards chaos. Open a history book, turn on the TV, you can see it everywhere. And Paul is not talking about people who stumble and struggle with sin. He is talking about people who are saying, this is just the way I want to be. Forget anything else. This is the way I want to be. And I think it interesting that literally on the same list that he puts witchcraft, drunkenness, and orgies, he puts on like jealousy, and dissensions and factions. And you might say, because God is very serious about sin. And you might say, dissensions, factions, that happens in Washington, D.C. <laughs> you know? And I would agree with you, it definitely does. But I would also put forward that it also happens around the water cooler at your workplace. As all of you triangle, trying not to talk to her, or talking about her when she's not in the room, or that guy when he's not around and trying to make sure everyone knows, and then you just step in and you're like, oh, you don't even know the half of it about this guy. Let's work against him. Maybe we can get him demoted or something. That we see it in big picture, but sometimes we miss it in the little picture. What happens when our selfish desires get the best of us? But then Paul continues to talk about these are the fruits of our selfish desires. What are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? In Galatians 22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is a fancy word for patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying one another. And when you're saved, when you're a follower of Jesus, it says the Holy Spirit dwells within you and that the Holy Spirit is producing things in our life. That as you're a follower of Jesus, if we wanna see, are you a real follower of Jesus? I'm gonna look at your life and say, do we see these things? Do we see an increase of love? Do we see an increase of joy, peace, patience, and all these other things? Because I can say all day long, oh yeah, I love Jesus. And then as soon as someone cuts me off in traffic, I pull over and I get on my car and I'm just like, are you serious? You know, like, <laughs> got a cross necklace on while I'm chewing this guy out, just being like, you're worthless. Like, oh my gosh. And the guy's like, oh man, like, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. And you guys will be watching the same thing. Like, I thought you said that you were like, like this, this fruit that you're bearing right now. It's a fit of rage. Let's go back here. It's literally, I'm seeing it in your selfish desires. But I'm gonna take a, Right turn here, and this is where it's gonna tie back into the title of my message of checking our root. Because sometimes we get very focused on the fruit. I think whenever I heard about the fruits of the Spirit, my brain would kind of start spinning to be like, okay, when I go home today, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, and then I'll be patient, then I'm good to go, you know? What do I have to do to do something to make myself more loving? How do I just like flex all of my spiritual muscles and then I'll make myself more loving, then I'll make myself more peaceful? But Paul actively speaks against that kind of thought previously in the letter that he wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 3, starting in verse 1. And you know that Paul had a close relationship with the people in this church because he uses very strong language here and you can only really do that with people that you really love. He says, you foolish Galatians, you silly people, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law, by working really hard? or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? In verse three, After beginning by the Spirit, are you trying to finish by the means of the flesh? We talked about last week. I recapped it just now. Who is the one who convicts us of sin, leading us into belief in Jesus? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who begun this work. The Holy Spirit doesn't snatch me and pick me up from where I am and then set me down over here and say, don't screw it up, see you later. (laughs) Have fun. (laughs) But Paul, that's what's the thing that I do. I do this. This is the big thing that I do. Sometimes I feel like Jesus is standing over in the corner waiting to knock me out. Like, you better start producing good fruit, boy. (laughs) Otherwise, we're going to have a problem. And I'm walking around trying to think of how can I do good things and not do bad things. And I'm trying really hard. I'm focusing on the good things and the bad things and trying to not do them or do them. But according to this, he says, if we've begun by the Spirit, then the Spirit is the one who's gonna finish the work, not you trying really hard. The Holy Spirit begun the work, he'll finish it. The Holy Spirit also wanted to begin the work, so he wants to finish it. You know who wants you to follow God's will for your life more than you do? It's God. You know who wants that messed up thing in your heart? to go away more than you do, God, who wants you to pursue other things and go after the things he has for you more than you do, once again, it is God. And through the Holy Spirit, that is available. But the thing is, is that we're not gonna be able to turn away from the acts of the flesh and turn to the spirit by our willpower. We do it by spirit power. My willpower may help me at a wedding to turn down the fifth piece of cake (laughs) because I know later it's not going to be good. 
It's wedding season. It's like every weekend. It's not good. <laughs> it's great, but it's not good. But an addiction, but a hurt, a deep hurt, a deep unforgiveness, a deep bitterness in my heart. My willpower is not going to just work hard enough that I'm going to be able to move past that. I need somebody helping me. But I think when we focus so much on the fruit, we forget what produces the fruit. The fruit comes from the tree, but what gives the tree what it needs to produce the fruit? What part of the tree digs down into the ground, digs deep down into the ground to get what the tree needs to produce the fruit that it makes? It's the roots. Actually, we have a photo. I totally forgot to show it first time, so you guys are special. I totally forgot to show it last time. Can we put up a photo that the, one, of the, one of the guys on our staff made? So sometimes we're thinking that like up in the tree, like that's where it's like, okay, like down here in my root, I'm trying to place kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I'm trying to put that down at the root and say, I'm gonna work really hard to be rooted in some of these things and you know that my life will just kind of take care of itself. When in reality, the fruits of the spirit aren't underground, they come from the top of the tree. And so the roots need to be dug down into something else. Our roots need to be digging down into Jesus. Our roots need to be digging down into the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that produces the fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces the fruits of the Spirit, so we need to dig into him. I think that sometimes if we're not seeing good fruit, you need to check your root. If you're not seeing good fruit in your life, you need to start with checking your root. I have a confession. I really like to argue. I love it. I love a good little, a little row, you know, for fun. You tell me which Star Wars movie you think is the best and I'll tell you why you're wrong. You know, like, <laughs> it's fun when everyone's on the same page. It's insufferable when you're not. But uh, my roommates and I would do that every once in a while and it was fun. But here's the thing. Yeah, like I say, it's fun when everyone's on the same page and we're just having like a fun debate. It's insufferable when you're not. That someone's like, oh, it's a nice day. And I'm like, is it? Is it though? It's 85. And it's like, dude, chill out. Like, okay, you know, like, let's get ice cream. It's hot. Let's get ice cream. And it's like, no, let's argue about this right now. And I want to stop doing that. I don't want to do that. And I'm better than I was before. <laughs> Ask my wife. I'm way better than I was before. But I want to get better and I want to keep working on it. But here's the thing. I don't want to turn off 24-hour news which is just a bunch of people yelling at each other and settling, settling their differences in a way that does not bring honor to Christ. In fact, it's actually just a bunch of people sitting and yelling at each other and telling them why they're dumb. By the way, I'm not talking about the 24-hour news that other people listen to. I'm also talking about the one that you listen to. I want to be less anxious. I want to feel less sad. I want to be less inside my own head. And yet whenever I'm faced with something that bothers me, that does bring me down, I pull out my phone and say, how long can I not think about this? When you're waiting for an elevator, man, I live on the third floor in a small, like a third floor apartment. I'm waiting for the elevator and I'm like, what's on my Gmail? It's like, nothing's on your Gmail because you looked at it like two minutes ago. But I can't even just sit and rest in peace because every time I'm trying to be in peace, I'm trying to distract myself because I feel my comfort comes from what's in my hand rather than drawing my comfort from the one who I'm in his hand. Is our source our money? Am I only peaceful when I feel like I've had enough money? When I feel like things are going good at work? When I feel like I'm getting the proper respect I deserve? When things are going good, basically? I can say all day that I am rooted in Jesus, but it's not until something goes wrong that you'll find out exactly where your roots are. I think that's the biggest thing we learned from 2020 was that we all were like, man, I love Jesus. Jesus is my rock. Jesus is my foundation. And then everything literally went a direction I never possibly thought it could. And we all lost our heads in a lot of different ways. And we all turned and we a lot of us showed what were the things that we're really clinging to. Because when I say what is our root, a root is what you turn to for truth. A root is what you turn to for comfort, for encouragement, 
A root is what shapes your reality that you draw from. And the story I'm gonna end on is a very strange story from the Gospel of Matthew. It's really weird, it's really odd. Matthew was one of Jesus's closest disciples and he wrote down a lot of stuff that Jesus said and did because he knew that it'd be important someday and here we are 2,000 years talking about it. It's gonna be on giant words back there. But in Matthew chapter four, Jesus had just been water baptized and then a voice from the sky literally said, this is my beloved son and with him I'm well pleased and everyone kind of freaked out, which you and I would too. But then instead of after this crazy moment, Jesus runs around and starts healing people, doing kinds of cool things, it says he withdraws and he leaves and the Holy Spirit leads him into the desert. And that is where our story begins. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, all this I'll just give you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels attended him. According to the Bible, there's spiritual good. It's God and the beings that follow him. But there's also spiritual evil. We spent a long time talking about the devil. But all we need to know right now is that there are spiritual evil that has no interest in King Jesus that we're singing about. Has no interest in him. And has no interest in you, despite even the things that the devil is saying, looking like he's trying to come to Jesus for Jesus' own good. And I could take apart this story. We could talk about the significance of the questions. We could talk about the significance of Jesus' answers. We could talk about so many things, but I want to focus on one detail that always makes me chuckle. It's in verse two. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Thanks. Like, <laughs> cool. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs> I'm usually hungry after like 40 minutes. I'm like later in the car, like, oh man, like we need to, I need a snack, like now. But think about it for a second. You've seen the Snickers commercials. What are you like when you're hungry? What are you like when you haven't eaten for 40, 40 40 hours is still a long time, four hours, you know? When you read the list of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, does that describe you when you're hungry? No, not me anyway. We're very temperamental as human beings, depending on how much sleep. Jesus was also in the wilderness. He didn't say he had an air mattress he was sleeping on. He was sleeping on the ground. There's wild animals out there. He probably woke up with a scorpion on him one time and was like, oh my goodness, like get out of here. He's under a lot of duress. He's under a lot of stress. And that is when the devil shows up. For a lot of us, it is when we're we're physically hungry that we see ourselves acting the fool, you know? But I would put forward also that a lot of times when we're spiritually hungry, it's when it's even worse. When I'm spiritually hungry because I'm drawing my roots into something else. That when I'm sad and sorrowful, I dig my roots down into Netflix and say, let me just watch this for five hours and that should make me feel better. And I'm hungry and the devil shows up or a temptation shows up or a bad decision shows up and says, hey, do this. This will be good. And I'm like, yeah, maybe that will be good. Why don't you ever go to the grocery store when you're hungry? Because you come home with three kinds of Oreos. However, 
it said that Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Fasting is a spiritual discipline we don't talk about very much. But it's a spiritual discipline in which we deny food and spend the time that we would be eating in prayer. It's saying, God, more than I need food that gives me life, I need you that gives me life. More than I want the comfort of food, I need the comfort, yeah. The more than I need food, I need the comfort of food, I need comfort of what you can do. Because Jesus, I can't produce these fruits in my life. I see myself withdrawing from love. I see myself giving my peace away all the time. And Jesus, I can't do this on my own. More than I need food, I need you. More than I need food, I need this. So Jesus was physically starving, but spiritually he was so full. Physically hungry, but spiritually so full. So when the devil shows up, each of Jesus' three responses come from the book of Deuteronomy, a book of the Bible that we skip a lot because we see it as a lot of laws. And yet, Jesus literally said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. His roots were so deep in scripture and he knew that scripture was true. As Christians, we would all say we believe that like, the Bible is the word of God and yet how much do we dig our roots into scripture? As Christians, we would all say that prayer is powerful and changes things, and yet, how often do we dig our roots down into prayer and expect things to change? We cannot produce the kind of fruit the Spirit gives us on our own. It's not about you trying so hard. You don't need to try so hard to do good things and try so hard not to do bad things. We just need to sink our roots into Jesus, and as we're fueled by Jesus, the fruit in our life changes. And worship team, you guys can come back out. When you're not seeing the kind of fruit of the spirit in your life, you need to check what you're rooted in and take those roots and move them elsewhere. Going into the rest of your week, asking Jesus, Jesus, what are the things I'm drawing into? I wanna stop being angry. What are the things I'm rooted into that are making me furious? I want peace, but what things am I rooted to that are actually, I think are giving me peace, but are actually sucking it away? Some things we're rooted into don't pour into us, they suck out of us. Remembering that our roots are the things that we turn to for truth, for comfort, for encouragement. And if that thing is not the Lord, if that thing is not Jesus, we're gonna come away empty. But practically, three things I wanna end on because I'm all talking about changing our roots, changing things, being rooted to Jesus, kind of practically in my life, what does that look like? What do I begin to do? Well, number one is finding a quiet place to pray every day. Somebody might be rolling your eyes at me. You're gonna mean we were talking for 20 minutes and you're gonna tell me to get away and pray. I'm like, yes. Read the Bible and you'll find how many times people were praying that when Jesus stood up to his test, he had just spent 40 days in prayer and fasting. And if that's the example that Jesus set for us and we call him king, let's follow his example. Doing this every single day, before I turn on my phone, before I turn on the news, before I turn on whatever, just saying, Jesus, I cannot produce the fruits of the spirit on my own. I've tried, but I find myself moving forward and then going 10 steps backwards and then feeling like you're mad at me, and then not talking to you for a while, and then coming back. And I don't wanna do that anymore. And so every day, just plugging into Jesus, spending that time alone to pray. The second thing, take in the word. Take in the Bible. We would all say as Christians that we believe the Bible is God's word for us, and yet how much of it do I even know? I say that the Bible tells me what's true, but how much of the Bible do I even take in as truth? And I say take it in because some of us are like, I am not a reader. I gotta wake up at like four in the morning to go to work. And so I'm gonna fall, I'm gonna, you're gonna have me open the Bible, I'm gonna fall asleep. Well, y'all, audiobooks are a thing and it's fantastic. On your drive to work, I know a guy who gotta wake up and he's gotta sit in a tractor and he just listens to the Bible in his tractor. He's like, I can't sit down and read. I don't have time to read, but I have time to listen. And I let God speak to me in that time, taking in the word that way. And lastly, it's just thinking about Jesus in your day. Sometimes you might spend that time with Jesus and then I go into the rest of my day thinking that Jesus is for church. I think about Jesus on Sunday morning. I think about him in the morning when I wake up and right before I go to bed at night. But in the middle of my day, I just, I just don't really draw my mind to him. And how different would it be 
when my coworkers are totally railing on one of my other coworkers behind their back. And I, want, I would feel really good just to jump in with them. But I remember that Jesus is with me. Man, what would Jesus do right now? When I see somebody in need and I'm like, man, that would just be so difficult to jump in. But what if my mind was so searched towards Jesus and I'm drawing from Jesus and always remembering that Jesus was there, things are just gonna start coming out of me that are good. And you can do that in 15 seconds. The middle of making a coffee when you're a barista middle of cleaning something at your custodial job, the middle of doing something as a nurse, stop for 15 seconds and saying, Jesus, you're here. I believe that you're here. I know that you're here. Will you just remind me that you're here? And then carry on. And I believe that if we all really commit to starting to do different things like that, digging our roots down into Jesus, you'll see the Holy Spirit transforming your life. And you don't need to work so hard to say yes to so many things and no to so many other things. Can we all stand as we finish here? And we know that we have the Holy Spirit because Jesus died on our behalf and sent the Holy Spirit to us that we may be forgiven. If we can all bow our heads and close our eyes across this place. I wanna pray for some people in this room that if you're here and we're talking about this God that died on our behalf so that we can have a new start, this God who produces good things in us despite of our efforts, despite of our sin, despite of our failures, he produces good things in us and there's nothing we can do about it. And you've never followed this God and today you wanna turn, you wanna start following this Jesus. Would you just put your hand over your heart and pray after me in your heart something like this, dear Jesus, I recognize that my sin has separated me from you, but I also recognize that you died in my place and that you rose from the dead three days later that I may have life and all of our hope is in you. And I pray today that you would forgive me and that you would cleanse me and that you would turn me towards you, help me to leave my old life behind and produce good fruit in my life. In Jesus' name and over the rest of us, God, I pray that you would show us what we are rooted in Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be the one who is showing us what we are rooted in. I pray that you would be showing us things that we've never even thought of. I pray that you would show us things that are harming us that we thought were doing us good. I pray that you would show us things that we are rooted in that are good, that we can just sink down deeper into. Give us encouragement. Jesus, I pray that you would produce that good fruit in us. Holy Spirit, we have no other hope but you. We can't produce any of these things on our own. And I pray that you would be producing it in us each and every single day. As we worship you, Father, help us to hear you and to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen.